I want us to start by just, just showing a, um, a, quick, a quick little video that's been prepared. I just wanted to um, l let people know that it's going to happen because, in fact, one of the things that is a consequence of um, the natural disasters that have occurred across this state is that many people um, were impacted by that and um, I don't want anyone to be re-traumatised or um, to um, be, you know, kind of distressed by any imagery that might come through. It's not a, it's not a bad video, so I don't want to set that up, but I just wanted to make sure that we acknowledge that um, those things are happening in our community at this point in time, and it's actually something that we need to be careful about. Um, so I might just get you to send that through. <laughs> As we weep for what we have lost, and as we grieve for family and friends, and we confront the challenge that is before us, I want us to remember who we are. We are Queenslanders. We're the people that they breed tough north of the border. We're the ones that they knock down and we get up again. see that um, there was a whole lot of effort that was kind of put in by a whole lot of people and in fact we've got a whole lot of people on our stage as you can well see um, who've actually contributed to that. that that piece of footage mostly focused on Brisbane as you can see and in fact one of the things that I thought was important about that is actually this building that you're in um, was flood affected and in fact um, you know I think uh, uh, Paul talks about that, you know, they had a five million litre swimming pool under the building for, um, for some time. So it's really, an in, it's, you know, it maybe grounds you into a space where, you know, you've kind of been swanning around the building and it's been, you know, it's a bit nice, it's a very nice building. But actually not very long ago it was actually um, an evacuated building that actually was affected by floods um, as many parts of our state were. 75% of Queensland was actually declared um, a disaster zone uh, throughout that period. And in fact, um, there's a whole lot of statistics that kind of exist around what happened, you know, um, 290 kilometre hour winds that occurred as part of, the, as part of Yarsi um, as that crossed the coast up in North Queensland. Um, it also, we also had 20,000 homes in, um, Queen, in Brisbane inundated uh, by the floods, $1.5 billion worth of insurance claims um, as a result of that sort of stuff. So some significant impacts that have occurred across these communities. Um, you know, towns that had been battered by cyclones not many years ago in the north battered again, um, and people getting up and making the best of what they've got 
as they move through that. Um, so it's, it's, it's great, I think, for us to take a little bit of time to reflect on that. And as I said, I want to introduce you to a couple of people who actually have had um, played quite significant leadership roles um, across the state or in their communities around looking at um, recovery, um, resilience and reconstruction uh, as, we, um, as we move on and um, tell the story about growth from these, what we've learned, uh, the messages that we've, you know, the, that how we in fact are becoming prepared for the next disaster because it surely will come. We're not sure when and we're not sure where, but it will, it will appear. So if I can introduce you to a couple, of, um, a couple of people across the panel. And the idea of this is actually just a conversation. So we haven't got a script that people are kind of working with. It is actually a conversation. And so um, there will be points where people are kind of, you know, working, working off each other and that sort of stuff. And I hope that, in fact, um, you enjoy the session. So if I can start by just um, uh, introducing people uh, down the line. Um, so Derek Tuffield's the CEO of Lifeline um, in um, the Darling Downs in southwest Queensland and they played a significant role based up in Toowoomba and as many people know Toowoomba um, was one of the places that suffered significantly um, in the early part in, in January um, but there are many things that occurred across um, the southwest region and into the Lockyer Valley um, and Derek was a key player in supporting um, communities across that uh, across that region um, through November, December, January and February and, um, and continues to this day. So welcome Derek. Yeah, thank you Wallace. That's right. Um, Mary Kelly. Mary Kelly works for the Reconstruction Authority um, and the Reconstruction Authority was very quickly set up um, in a, as a response to um, needing to rebuild such a large part of the state and it's great to have Mary, uh, Mary Ann sorry, on board um, and uh, uh, able to kind of you know, contribute some of the work that's been going on and her role has actually been about looking at community resilience engagement sort of strategies. Um, moving quite quickly, Linda McClellan. Linda McClellan is actually from up in, up in North Queensland, um, Hinchinbrook uh, Community Support Centre, which is based up in Ingham, which is, um, you know, which is one of the places that actually received um, much of the force of Yarsias across the coast earlier this year. But also Ingham actually um, pretty much is in a flood plain and actually floods on a regular basis. So in fact, their preparedness for that sort of stuff is, is probably quite high. And I think messages and stories from that are quite significant. Um, Paul Vivian is uh, Paul Vivian's from the Brisbane Convention uh, and Exhibition Centre and um, uh, provide us with some of that footage and that sort of stuff. So from a different perspective, what does it, make, what does it look like in a building like this? How do you actually contribute to a community? How do you, how do you actually be part of um, the recovery and reconstruction? How do you work with suppliers that are based in the Lockyer Valley who actually supply you fruit and vegetables who have been de devastated by floods? And how do you continue to support their businesses um, as we grow? So welcome to you too, Paul. Thank you. Um, and uh, I think as we're, um, Claire um, Isaacs is, uh, works for Volunteering Queensland and um, I'm sure Claire all mentioned to us, but one of the things that Claire had to deal with um, at Volunteering Queensland was about 80,000 people who put their hand up to volunteer um, in a very short space of time and um, actually being able to cope with that and provide people with a, um, an experience where they can contribute. Um, as you saw, many people were out and about and in, um, working in communities um, you know, just turning up with shovels or brushes or um, boots and gloves and um, uh, cleaning up or, um, you know, trying to help people out as it goes through. So um, Claire's got a lots, lots of stories and it's great to kind of have you around, Claire, and I think good work that Volunteering Queensland did. And finally, Kelly Ewing. Kelly Ewing is from um, the Central, um, Central Highlands uh, in Queensland, which is up in uh, Emerald, which is, you know, big mining kind of town, uh, mining space and that sort of stuff. Um, and probably not many people realise, but actually um, Central Highlands was actually, um, their first floods came through in the early part of December. Um, uh, and indeed, um, that whole community um, was impacted by that. So there's this whole sense of um, the broad spread of Queensland being part of that kind of, um, kind of that approach. So um, can you join with me in welcoming these people? So the opportunity, I guess, is for us to, uh, I just want to kind of open up the conversation a bit. And one of the things, as I said to you before, um, these people on the stage have actually provided significant leadership in their communities, um, in their organisations and that sort of stuff. And one of the things I think that uh, in terms of learnings and um, information that may be, interest, may be of interest to you was actually about that. And so I want to open up by just asking um, people to start thinking about and contributing to a conversation around um, uh, what was it that they had to do to, um, you know, to provide the sort of leadership that they have shown, both in crisis but also post-crisis, when in fact what we're needing to do is actually take 
very clear and measured steps about how we recover from, uh, from this. So um, do you want to, can I get you to start, Linda? Maybe, I'm just sort of thinking, yeah. Uh, yes, Wallace, I suppose <coughs> our community, as Wallace said, our community um, struggles with flooding quite regularly, but this was a different event. We started preparing for our involvement in these events, I suppose, back in the early, um, probably in 2005 and there. I think at that stage we had the services and we knew we could contribute uh, to the recovery and also to the response and we had the services, but it was really up to us to put our hand up and say, we need to be there, we need to be part of the action, we know our community, we've got the services. Um, involve us and we can assist. So it was up to us to, to step forward and say we've, we've got a hand in this and we can help. Yes, from um, our perspective at Volunteering Queensland, as um, Wallace mentioned, I think the peak number of calls we'd received in the 10 years prior to the floods was about 48 on one day when our server went down. Uh, on the 14th of January, we received over 27,000 registrations in one day. Um, I actually joined as a volunteer at Volunteer in Queensland um, and have just stayed there ever since. And I think that's part of um, the story of what the community brings together and what um, sort of um, effect. It still gives me shivers to watch those kinds of um, things, not so much from the sadness of what happened and the loss, but from the amazing community spirit that we experienced. And I'll never forget um, the lovely and beautiful offers of help around the community. And I guess for volunteering Queensland, what it meant is certainly um, we could never, and I think every agency and every seminar I've ever sat on this year has all have all talked about the fact that we cannot, we could not ever have predicted <laughs> what happened. If you're in prepared um, cities and you're in prepared regional areas that are used to this kind of event, uh, no one foresaw it, no one knew the extent. So I guess um, the learnings from all around the state have definitely been. Um, with a sense of forgiveness of, of, of what happened in, early, in the early stages to say, look, you know, it's not really an excuse, it's sort of an explanation for how do we really prepare? What, uh, everyone who has ever lived in Queensland, and I was talking to this to the other panellists before we started, everyone who's ever lived in Queensland understands weather events. It's what we've been brought up with, you know, it's what we, we're totally used to. And I was saying last week when I was driving and we had our first couple of thunderstorms for this season, it now has a, a sense of trepidation and fear. And I think for all the panellists here, I know for myself, uh, you know, the job certainly is not over and the planning is continuing and the season is coming up way too fast already and there's a lot of um, tired, <laughs> exhausted people in, in these services but we're all still very committed to the safety and preparedness of our community and I think that has been the, the most wonderful resilience message. It certainly restored a lot of faith in the community and what it can bring the billions of literal dollars that volunteering saved the state and the country um, in just the outpouring of assistance to get people back on their feet. Um, I will be interested to see what the consensus says about how it's, um, how it's, oh, sorry, the census says about how it's been measured. Um, but, you know, it is in the billions of, um, of actual help that has been brought to help people recover and it still is an ongoing process. I was going to quickly just add, just to say that um, some of those images were of the centre here. We employ up to 650 people, so we're like a little community anyway. And um, I kind of feel that, you know, we, we cleaned up the building, like the staff. We couldn't call, so Joe's cleaner down the road, because Joe was busy cleaning his house. So we looked after ours. And yet, our, we're very big on our supply chain. And that's, it's a local supply chain. And uh, one of my other hats is in, um, from the green or sustainable business side of things, and that's the way we work. And we're very, you know, what you had for lunch today, the lettuce on the table was from a local supplier. We didn't bring it in from um, a, a greater distance. And, and a lot of those, you know, the, the, you saw that little backhoe pushing the mud down the street? Mm -hmm. That's one of our suppliers. Hey, you guys need a hand. I'll be around with my backhoe in a minute and I'll give you a hand. And yet we're buying his fruit and veg. And, and I think that's really important. So 
we all rolled up in that, that whole mateship sort of mm. thing. That's what it's all about. And I think mm. we're all proud mm. to be Queenslanders. But equally, uh, it's funny, but I think when you're faced with such a, a natural disaster, you know, there are two options. One, you use the door, or two, you roll up your sleeves. And I think that's what we all had to do. And um, from a business point of view, um, we, we live in a world where communication, it, it happens, you can be told 20 minutes later you're sitting in the lunchroom, I was, when Christchurch had their earthquake. And I'm looking at that on the telly while I'm eating my tuna sandwich, I'm thinking, gee, that's, that's, a, that's awful. But then I went back to my desk, so I can disengage. And I think in this world we, we, we get information so quickly, it's happened, there it is, and, and we expect to be able to switch it off and walk away from it. We, we couldn't do that here. It was, you went outside your door and, ooh, hang on a minute, there's mud everywhere or, or whatever. So yeah. I think people had to just take action and, and get involved yeah. and, and make it happen. And I, I think from that, it was amazing to think, wow, the fruit have brought his digger over to help us clear the, the street. I mean, that, that to me was a sense of community and a, we, we pulled together. And I, I think that we talk about the, the costs and the, I've got my, did anyone else volunteer here in Brisbane? Yeah. Get on the bus and... Yeah, right. Did you get your certificate from the Lord Mayor? Yeah, I framed it. It's in the loop. It's looking great. <laughs> you know, but some would turn around and say, well, gee, the, you know, the council spent a lot of money doing that and whatever. I mean, we weren't allowed to use language, I say, but you know, I say bollocks to that. It was great because it meant that it was, we did work for people that would, they would never have been able to do it. You know, the council wouldn't be able to get the, st the, the, the work people to go to those yeah. areas and clean it up. So yeah. I, I think in the first instance that, that's what we had to do. Yeah. And um, absolutely Brisbane benefited because we, we, work, um, we work for Queensland and Australia for that matter. We bring in a lot of international delegates which, I'm sorry, I'm the salesman here at the BCC, so I'm going <laughs> to... You might not have guessed that. I'm going to get that happening now. But, <laughs> you know, the, it is, it's good, good business um, for the state. And suddenly everyone's out there and they're seeing on their screen, on their iPad or whatever, not just here in Queensland, not just here in Australia, but worldwide. I've got family in UK. Paul, are you all right? Yeah, yeah, we're fine. You know, but yeah. it's there. Straight away that information's there. So one of the first things that the BCEC did was to, from a communication point of view, was to get on board and get people, get that message out so people can understand that, yes, there's been a flood, and it didn't, yeah, the water receded and away it went and we cleaned up a bit. There are still, I've got still, I say clients, mates, that are still coming into their houses now. They're only just getting back in, moving yeah. back in. And I think it was important to give that message, yes, we're back in business, but equally, um, don't go away, don't suddenly think, oh, let's not go to Brisbane. It's flooded yeah. because, and it goes back to that supply chain. If I'm not purchasing vegetables from down the road to put it on your plate when you attend a conference here, the, the impact all the way along the line, because those, those farmers, yeah. it was washed away. Yeah, yeah. Derek, I might get you, so, I mean, those farmers that you're talking about are directly related to the work that you were doing. Grantham is in the Lockyer Valley. Um, we all would have seen images of the, you know, the devastation at, um, in Grantham and, you know, the town was closed for quite a long time um, and that sort of stuff and there's work going on there. Just talk about the sort of stuff that's kind of been happening for you and the work that you've kind of had, essentially had to do to kind of... Since the floods? Since the floods, yeah, yeah. Uh, the number of the small farmers that uh, exist in the Lockyer Valley, still, still they're not producing at the moment. Um, the, the amount of debris that actually got washed onto the fields was fairly extensive. And so, uh, you know, you have con what I call conglomerate farmers, big, big farming operations that got going fairly quickly, but the small ones had lo lots of rocks and debris. And so initially um, there was a lot of support going in, and still is, about trying to get those farms operational again. And uh, financial stress at the moment is probably one of the really big issues that we're seeing that's, that's raising its head. And, and a lot of farmers are very independent people. Uh, you know, in Australia, the average age of a farmer today is 63. And uh, so a lot of these people are not used to asking for help. So gaining their trust and, and their confidence that you could go on, provide support, maintain confidentiality and get assistance for them, those are some really key mm. issues. Mm. And, and for a number of them that we're working with, that, that's still ongoing. They're, they're not 
fully up on their feet at the moment. Yeah. Uh, but the communities, um, you know, it's, it's rebuilding. There's lots you're probably hearing in the news about um, people moving houses to higher ground and land mm. ballots and, and that. But it's, uh, it's a still a stressful time in that Lockyer Valley. Yeah, good. So we've got five, uh, five councillors working there at the moment. Yeah, great. I just, um, just might invite Kelly to kind of talk about it because um, often people, you know, you would have probably seen the images of the Lockyer Valley and Toowoomba and Brisbane, you know, the, and the, you know, the walkway floating off down the river. Um, probably you didn't see very many images of, you know, the central highlands and the, the devastating floods that occurred across the many towns there. Um, I invite Kelly to kind of talk about some of, the, some of the impact and some of the great work that's kind of progressed since, um, since then. Thanks, Wallace. I suppose um, Emerald or the Central Highlands was the, probably the first place where the floods sort of kicked off in Queensland. Um, we had our first incident probably at the end of November and our second incident um, in um, obviously the 10th, December 2010 went into January 2011. Um, one of the approaches that we probably took um, this time, because we had a bit of a previous experience in 2008 where we had a lot of learnings. Um, as a community support health and wellbeing group was that we need to take a, probably a, a strategic approach to look at our, our, um, our community of Emerald, but also because our uh, region was affected, we need to look at a regional perspective as well. Um, and one of the reasons why we probably took a, um, a strategic approach was that um, from our experience, um, right at the initial stages of preparedness and the alert phase of responding to the floods was that external agencies um, come into our community um, for maybe up for maybe two weeks to four weeks, depending on um, the, the impact of the disaster. And they provide a lot of resources around that time. And when I'm talking about that, I'm talking about um, you know recovery centres, evacuation centres, the Red Cross Department of Communities, uh, Lifeline for that matter. They prov provide a lot of intense resources, which is fantastic. However, they leave our community. Um, and they don't leave a lot behind. So that's, so that's one of the reasons why we looked at the longevity of uh, or taking a st strategic approach as a health and wellbeing group. Um, our health and wellbeing group is, is pretty much um, made up of the membership of um, community agencies where we all have a role to play, I suppose. And as the chair of that, that um, community sport and health and wellbeing group, uh, my role was to look at the bigger picture with, with that, uh, those agencies and discuss what we needed, what we believe we needed. Mm -hmm. And one of those, um, I suppose, projects was looking at um, a health and wellbeing strategic um, plan over a 12 month period. And that was to look at the, um, the health and wellbeing, I suppose, of our, of our region. And so what we did was we discussed with communities around what do you think you may, may require or believe um, you want over the next 12 months. So our health and wellbeing strategic plan looks at um, anything from training to actually having some fun activities. So every month in a, um, a particular um, township around the Central Highlands, there'll be an activity or some sort of training that people are invited to participate in. And we're probably um, six months down the track and we've really had some really good input into um, you know those activities and, and training around the Highlands, yeah. and I mean that goes from anything from Emeralds to um, you know places like Rolston and Springshaw and, and Jeringua, who were all cut off. So that's one of the projects that we believe that yeah. has been quite effective through the through the floods with people's recovery process. Yeah. Um, Marianne, from the Reconstruction Authority's kind of point of view, so it was quickly established um, after the. Uh, you know, after the natural disasters that we're experiencing here. So, and you had to be up and running really, really quickly, I'm sure, and that stuff, you know, a report was um, uh, released, you know, a couple of months later, um, looking, at, uh, looking at the kind of natural disaster and that stuff. So from your point of view, what have you kind of seen? What's the sort of resilience stuff that you're seeing around, around the state? What are the, sorts of, what are sorts, what are the key components of um, what resilience looks like when it occurs in communities? Um, yeah, we did have to be up and running pretty quickly. I, I think, as the other panellists have said, the, the thing is that these disasters, the impact on Queensland between November and actually probably April of this year, were unprecedented. Um, I think as a state, Queensland is very well prepared to respond to disasters. Um, you know, Lifeline and others like yourself have, have, have got good plans in place, but there was nothing like what we saw this time. Every, every community in Queensland was affected in some way. Um, so that strategic response was really important um, from the government's point of view. 
they wanted to put in place something that could really help fast track um, the reconstruction and recovery, but actually try and work in a bit of a different way in terms of really, really focused uh, cross-sector teams um, around specific issues. So one of the things I had to set up um, in the early days, because I'm actually originally from the Department of Communities and have moved across to the Queensland Reconstruction Authority, was a statewide um, human and social recovery group. And from our perspective, it was really key to have it, the key government agencies there, like the Department of um, Communities and Queensland Health, but also to have our key recovery partners there like Lifeline, Salvation Army, um, uh, St Vincent de Poor, and Red Cross. Uh, and that statewide group ended up being a really important mechanism for ensuring that we're getting the right services at the right places and we're putting the resources in communities effectively and, and responsibly. But also really important to, and the Reconstruction Authority it is very much about this mandate that recovery is about the community driving the recovery and it has to come from within that community and really what the state can do and what the state should do is facilitate that. Uh, so our kind of role and particularly my role within the authority is around creating the mechanisms and in lots of ways creating the space for communities to drive their own recovery um, and I think uh, Queensland has been fantastic around disaster and disaster response. One of the areas I think that we've really seen a lot of learnings and a lot of improvement is around recovery and recovery over the long term. Mm -hmm. And understanding that you might get the road up and running in six months, but actually it actually takes a good two years, if you're lucky, to get the community up and running. Mm -hmm. um, um, one of the key phrases that has come out of a group we've been working with in uh, Victoria is uh, creating a new normal. And I think that's a really, really important thing, and that can only come from the community. And, and I agree with everything that's said. And something I said to Wallace before this was, we are different now, but we're not, we're not defined by the event. We're not defined by that natural disaster. And the key learning is to involve the community, because that's the only thing you can guarantee that the next time there's a disaster, the community will be there but we don't know if the agencies and the state government will be there. So we, what we need to do is make sure that we skill up our local people to, to better cope with the event in the future. And what we've learnt during a Cyclone Yasi, I'm born and bred North Queenslander. I know exactly what to put in evacuation kit, that I know I need a torch and I know I need a battery, but what I know more than anything now is what I didn't know. Mm. I didn't know how scary it was going to be. I didn't know how to live two weeks without power. So what our community has learnt is a whole lot of new skills. 101 way ways, uses for a wheelie bin. <laughs> That's what our community has learnt. And our community, people are talking. People are, um, you know, cross-secting ideas. Um, the morning I woke up, Cyclone Yasi's coming, I woke up, all of a sudden it's Category 5. First thing I did was ring my best friend at Mission Beach. She went through Cyclone Larry. I said, tell me what to do. And that's our community is buzzing with those good news stories. How did we save our, um, wheel, uh, how did we su save our roller doors? How come your roller door didn't buckle in and his did? So our community is constantly learning from this and I think growing stronger and it's it's our responsibility to capture that information so that it goes on mm -hmm. and other communities can experience from our learnings as well. Mm -hmm. I think sometimes we probably don't give our communities enough credit or how much resilience they actually do have. Um, mm -hmm. You know one of the premises that when we're looking at our, um, our mm -hmm. community health and wellbeing subgroup was that 80% of our community will recover and 20% will need a you know, some, some, some sort of guidance. And that was pretty much drove us to where we are now. And it's about community getting together. I mean, Wallace was talking before about um, Emerald having a, a bit of a mining boom. And certainly we have a lot of mine sites around um, um, Emerald in the surrounding areas. And what um, the strength was, was our community, our, our local government working with the state government, but also working across sector of um, you know, the, the corporate bodies. And I'm talking about communities, um, mining here, mining industry. Was, 
um, these guys couldn't work because of whatever it might reason, the, the, you know, the open cut might have been flooded or the underground or they couldn't get to actually get to work. So the, they coordinated their men or, or their employees to actually get together and with the council and actually clean up our community. I think it was done within seven days mm. of, mm. you know, these amazing resources getting together, coordinating a response and really helping us through the physical recovery. Mm. Derek, I might just get you to kind of talk about because I think that the angle that I was um, that I'm interested in was in talking with Derek was about how do we how do we move on? How do we actually learn about how we need to coordinate services? You know, much much about what you're talking about um, and that sort of stuff. And I know you've been doing a lot of work around that, and you know, there's some new strategies that you got in place as a consequence of what didn't occur or what didn't occur as well um, this time through. Look, I guess uh, in the in the panel, obviously we we met before we came on stage and. And we were talking about the importance in uh, the recovery role and uh, you know, uh, Lifeline's role uh, over the past 20 odd years is, is community recovery. How do, how do we support the people most affected uh, and how do we try and get normality uh, restored back in their life to the best way we can? Um, and so uh, we developed a program up called uh, Psychological First Aid uh, and it's a course that we've been running so that any community recovery workers that Lifeline puts in the field now must have done a community recovery uh, course, a psychological first aid course, and, uh, and be qualified. And what, when the floods, and if I can just talk for a minute, when the floods uh, happened on the Darling Downs, uh, from my perspective uh, as CEO, uh, they actually started in Warwick on, on Boxing Day, on the night of Boxing Day. Um, then uh, the floods uh, did a bit of a left-hand turn, went out through Dolby, then Chinchilla, then Condamine. Then on the 10th of January, uh, we had the, the huge floods in Toowoomba, which uh, did a left-hand turn also, went out and uh, knocked out Oakey. And then we had separate floodwaters that went down the range, did Withcott, Murphy's Creek, Halliden, Grantham, Gatton, Laidley, Lowood, Forest Hill, Bang. So you've got massive areas that are fairly inundated. And, and the learnings, I guess, for this is about you've got to get people on the ground when the area is safe. First, it's got to be secured and safe. And of course, the range, you might recall, the Toowoomba range got knocked out at the yeah. same time. Uh, lots of it collapsed. So part of the strategies for the future and the learnings is that if we can skill up uh, in psychological first aid training other non-government agencies and people in the local communities across the Lockyer Valley, Toowoomba, the southwest, when the activations occur in, f in future, we activate them, provided that they are not uh, affected by the floods. And they're local people, and, and local people respond better because they know the train. And certainly in Toowoomba, I can recall at the recovery centre quickly at Long Street, where people had been flown in from Adelaide, mm -hmm. and people who had been affected said, look, OK, you've got to go down uh, to the Condamine building. And they said, where's that? And I said, well, look, we don't know. And, and, and for them it might sound like much, but it actually was another setback for them. Mm -hmm. So uh, that local input we agreed as a panel is really important. So that's one strategy. And how that would work would be an organisation like Lifeline takes the lead role and has memorandums of understanding with organisations like, you know, uh, Relationships Australia, St Vincent de Paul, Centre Care and, and uh, a raft of other uh, non-government service providers but they come under Lifeline's control for that period of community recovery. And then when it's over, we release them back to their jobs again. And we can use that right through the South West. So that's a strategy we're looking at at the moment. Mm. 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 Other I mean, I'm also interested in terms of the additional strategies that you know, Volunteering Queensland's put in place. As I said, there's a huge number of people who put their hand up you know, um, and said, we want to come and do something. How do we deal with that? How do we cope with that sort of um, that outpouring of kind of support or um, need to do something? Yeah, and I guess that was one of the um, key issues that emergency response teams dealt with is having um, <laughs> we've got the bell already. Yeah. Having people <laughs> that <laughs> way quickly. Going, going, oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's that funneling. Don't, don't be <laughs> <laughs> no, wait. The service that uh, we provided is the the funneling of that unskilled workforce, if you like, because 
Uh, even today, we're, we're still calling people one-on-one -on -one and sending them out to help and volunteer on site yeah. in places like Grantham, Murphy's Creek, etc., and in the local region here. Um, we're finding that a lot of people didn't know it was still going on, and a lot of people are very upset that they weren't contacted immediately the day of the floods, because, you know, on the day of the call, they're like, I'm ready, I'll go anywhere, I'll fly anywhere, I'll get a horse, wherever I need to go, I'll go. Um, and I guess for us, our learning has been about managing that community expectation of the non-flood affected people who have this outpouring of emotion, where does that go? How do we funnel that in a meaningful way? And one of the biggest um, ideas of, of the re response to extreme weather that we were focusing on was, was this preparedness message and making sure that everyone in the community understands if you're unskilled in an emergency, you're actually more of a hindrance than a help in the most part. And this is the feedback we've got from all our agencies, mm -hmm. Lifeline, any of these, these good people mm -hmm. sitting here. Um, you need skills in this, especially in places like Grantham, only emergency service personnel allowed in. We've got you know all kinds of trauma going on in there um, and still in a lot of these regions. So yeah. what our message really is and we're trying to get across is um, if you can, in the quiet season now, go out. Join up um, with Lifeline if you have a, a background in counselling. Go and get trained as an, a Ready Plan emergency volunteer with Red Cross. Do the things if you have that willingness to go and actually be useful in an emergency situation. Or think about it when that emergency happens that you know. I will have to sit back a bit because it's not reasonable for me to go out and save someone, you know, from floodwaters. I'm not trained. I will end up being in the floodwater with the emergency <laughs> service and needing to be rescued as well. So that's our biggest learning, biggest message. If you can take those 80,000 people, when you look at the number of people actually were flood affected versus the number of people that wanted to help flood affected, um, that's a much bigger group that wanted to help. And that much bigger group has a, has a, is a message we're trying to get out to the community. Think about how you can actually help. If you want to help in a meaningful way, look now for training opportunities. Look now for really having your own emergency plan to help your local neighbour. Uh, we have a, a, a project going at the moment called the Disaster Readiness Index. It's on our um, Volunteering Queensland website. Bit of a plug. Um, <laughs> but I, I plug it because it's, it's very helpful for the wider community to understand do I have a Stago pack? Would I know what to do with a wheelie bin? Do I know those 101 <laughs> uses? And um, have I already bought my safety gear um, so when the floods do come, I'm not stuck at Bunnings looking at empty, you know, Wellington boots aisle going, oh, I should have got in earlier. So, you know, it's about taking responsibility for yourself. And a lot of the emergency services groups talk about, are you prepared for 72 hours of no electricity, water or other means as a worst case scenario. I think in this day and age we rely a lot on fast information, we rely a lot on people saving us. A lot of the um, retirement villages we approached about safety planning <coughs> said, what would you do in an emergency? And they said, well, we'd, we'd go and stand out the front and call the police. <laughs> and usually that would work though. We've got so used to that being someone else will help us. When they're helping people who actually need more help, that's when you have a problem. And that was the beautiful lesson, I think, of everything that we've all experienced this year, is that you have to first look back on yourself, check your neighbour, know where the vulnerable people are in your community, be ready to help them, say a hi in the morning, even if you don't want to talk to them anymore, uh, you know, but, but know they're there and know, think about, what would I do, you know? It's, it's now not as much of a hypothetical as it used to be. It is a reality that we all went through this year. Mm. And the more people that can help themselves, if they're not seriously affected, the more that the communities will get to that resilience stage more quickly. Great. Absolutely. Great. I'm really conscious of time. And I guess the final message <laughs> that's coming from that is to say, really, it's not, about, it's not the story about what happened. Whilst that's really interesting and really important, it's actually about how you respond to that. That's the most important part of it. You can join with me in thanking the panel. Thank you.